very pleased to be here. Um, as Renske said, this uh, talk is derived from a memoir project that I'm working on uh, about New York in the 1970s. Um, the memoir is called, uh, tentatively, Before Pictures, and as Renske said, it refers to the exhibition that I made at Artist Space in 1977. Uh, it's a, was that, a sm that, that was a small exhibition that uh, introduced uh, a group of artists uh, who were using appropriation, or what we came to call appropriation, um, and it had turned to, um, after years of investigations of abstraction, had turned to uh, questions of popular culture and the image, again. Such figures as Cindy Sherman, Sherry Dean, Robin Longo. Uh, so that's the, that, that exhibition is more or less the, uh, the moment, I think, from which people know my work. So this memoir is actually about the period before people know my work. Um, this particular part I, I call action around the edges. And I begin with a quotation uh, from a radio interview that the artist Gordon Manor Clark gave to Liza Baer about this work, Day's End, in the year following its completion in 1975. He said, I should start with how it happened. I mean, what it's like to wander for months around New York City, trying to find a space to do a piece of work, and especially something to that scale that I've been able to do in other places, but not in New York City. Originally, what I had cited on were the facades, because as you go down the pier, driving down the pier along that empty highway in front, the facades are an incredible animated grouping of different eras and different personalities. And I wanted to deal with one of the earlier ones, which this is, a turn of a century facade. There's a classic sort of tin classicism, and to cut at that facade. So the ones that I found originally were all completely overrun by the gays, and S&M, you know, that whole S&M shadows of waterfront, and then Liza Bear interrupts him and says, meat market. And Matter Clark continues, not really the meat market, further down around Christopher Street. And then this part of the interview trails off and they move on to another subject. <clears throat> the day in August that I'd chosen to move from Greenwich Village to Tribeca was one of the hottest of the summer of 1974. I rented a van and got my on-again, off-again boyfriend, Richard, to help out. My apartment on 10th Street, west of Hudson, was a fourth-floor railroad flat. My new place was a spacious, skylit loft on Chamber Street, also west of Hudson. I'd arranged to use the freight elevator in the loft building for the day, uh, which was a rickety old elevator operated by pulling down hard on the hoist cable uh, on a pulley system and stopped by yanking the other cable. It was a challenge to bring it level with the floor. After piling all of my belongings on the elevator's platform, Richard and I, and the artist next door from whom I was subletting my loft, managed to get the overloaded elevator to start its ascent. But by the time we reached the third floor, it came to a grinding halt and started sliding back downwards. We all grabbed the cable and tried to slow the elevator's <coughs> plunge and did manage to prevent a free fall, but it crashed onto the basement floor nevertheless. After recovering our wits and finding ourselves luckily unharmed, we had to lug my belongings through the old industrial building's dank basement and up the back stairs, make our way with them through a jam-packed hardware store on the ground floor, and then haul them up four more flights of stairs. 
My new loft had some other amenities besides the skylight. One of them with a classy provenance. The space had previously been rented by the set designer Robert Israel, from whom I bought the fixtures, which are the necessary facilities for conversion of a commercial, excuse me, of a commercial loft into a residence, plumbing uh, and appliances for the kitchen and bathroom, uh, space heaters and the like. Among these was a stage-like platform about 10 feet square and standing two feet above the floor, which Robert must have used for mock-up stage designs. I positioned it underneath the skylight and used it as a spatial demarcation from my bedroom. I didn't pay undue attention to the symbolism of bedroom as whitely lit stage, but I guess it was apt for that moment of my life. The fixture with the provenance was a large refrigerator freezer that had been given, by, given to Jasper Johns by Marion Javits, the art collector and socialite wife of New York State's liberal Republican senator. Johns had given it to Robert, and Robert sold it to me. It stopped working the following summer, so I found a $35 replacement at a used appliance store on Kenmare Street, just east of Soho. This one was a Raymond Lowy design General Electric model from the 1940s with a freezer compartment just big enough for ice cube trays. I kept it for the next 20 years, and it still worked fine when I finally replaced it. My move from Greenwich Village to Tribeca came about as a result of my decision to get serious about being an art critic, to replace the gay scene with the art scene. I suppose it was a moment of my latent Calvinism taking hold. I'd come to feel myself adrift, not accomplishing enough, not spending enough time with the crowd to which I rightly belonged. My exchange of one scene for another was destined to fail, of course, but my attempt to achieve it with an essentially spatial implementation interests me at this point. The immediate impulse is not easy for me to reconstruct, but it had something to do with that sometime boyfriend who helped me move and crashed with me in the elevator. A friend had told me that Richard was inappropriate for me, something that has been said more than once about the objects of my sexual interest. But in this case, I took the opinion more or less to heart, because Richard had become my tormentor. The on-again, off-again character of the affair was, in fact, quite brutal. As soon as I became really hooked on him, he'd abruptly ditch me. And just as I was getting over being jilted, he'd come back pleading that he couldn't live without me, and I'd get hooked once again. This emotional s &M had its physical side, too which is no doubt what enthralled me in the first place. But beyond these commonplace facts of what is called a relationship, Richard was indeed very different from me, intellectually and politically. I came most fully to realize this when he informed me in the summer of 1975 that he was going to work for Jimmy Carter's election. I was horrified. A born-again Christian from the South the man who famously proclaimed that he had sinned in his heart because he had impure sexual thoughts. But I'm getting ahead of the story, because by the time Jimmy Carter's campaign was underway, I was about to move out of the Chamber Street loft further downtown to Fulton Street, and this time I had the good sense to hire professional movers. The emotional turmoil of my affair with Richard had come to symbolize for me my participation in the gay scene more generally, unjustly, of course, and my sense that I'd be better off living further downtown in Tribeca was determined in my memory of it now by an event that represented a substitute love object. Sometime in the spring of 1974, 